I wish that my career, I wish I could tell you that I did something really awesome to get this job, but it'd be a complete lie. I didn't. How many of you know the website realqueerpolitics.com? Okay, about 30 of you. They didn't have a science site, and when I was not doing work in the lab, I was reading their site. And I thought, boy, it'd be really great if there was a, a single source of information for science. So I emailed them, the, the boss, and I said, I think you should do this with science. I'm finishing my PhD, I would like to do that for you. And he hired me. That's it. That was my career transition, and it, that changed my life. I would not recommend that to be your way of getting a career. Just email people and say, hey, please give me a job. It's usually harder than that. I will talk to you about what I think is the best career path for you, okay? Uh, I've actually spoken to someone who did the traditional career path to get where she is, and I'll tell you her story in a little bit. So what do I do at Real Queer Science? Oh, by the way, uh, if you want, if you have any questions, if I say something that's off or strange or you want to know more about it, just shout it out. Um, I, 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 I like laid back talks, so just, uh, just yell at me. So what is real queer science? What do we do? Well, if you're not familiar with it, it's what we call curated aggregation or, or intelligent aggregation. So instead of having uh, something like the website science, well, no, that's not fair. Uh, there are aggregators out there where you can just say, give me all the science news you can find, and then you just get thousands of articles every day. That's not particularly useful. So we do what's called intelligent aggregation. We actually will read the internet all day. I have a bookmark list of about 100 different sites, and I check various sites throughout the day, and I see what's, what's the most interesting story here. I check the BBC, Nature. It's all uh, popular science, because if we were linking to abstracts, nobody would understand it. So we link to popular science, but reputable popular science stuff. We're not linking to, well, I'm not going to name names. We're not, <laughs> linking, <laughs> we're not linking to garbage. We're linking to reputable sites. You know, so BBC science, New York Times science, Nature, science news. That's what I, that is the primary focus of real queer science. We also aggregate press releases, so universities send out press releases. If you don't know this, the University of Washington has a press <coughs> office, and every time something cool comes out, it's their job to publicize it. So they take your research and they write up a, a report about what you just did, and they send it out to journalists all over the world saying, hey, look what's going on at the University of Washington. Okay? If you weren't aware of that, you need to talk to your press officer. Because it's kind of their job to know who the, the professors are. And it's an, actually a really cool line of work. This is a, a place where you can get a job. You can you know, work as a press officer. That's a lot of people toil away in anonymity writing press releases for universities. They need scientists to do that. That's one career path. So we, we aggregate press releases as well, and we aggregate videos. And to our knowledge, we're the only video aggregator on the internet or for science videos. We haven't found a in this. Uh, that's not the only thing that we do. Because if all we did was aggregation, you can only build an audience so high. You're not going to start to get bigger and bigger and bigger. The way you get bigger and bigger and bigger is by having your own original content. And thankfully, we have three incredibly talented writers. <laughs> me. Uh, and then we have, actually, who is becoming probably a better writer than me. Uh, Ross Pomeroy, our assistant editor, who writes four articles per week, and he is amazingly talented. And we have a physics guy that we uh, bribed to write for us as well, because we don't have any expertise in physics, and so we found a guy at the University of Texas to write physics pieces for us. So that, and we put out about seven or eight articles per week doing that. And we're starting to get noticed. Uh, the website Big Think is now actually uh, reprinting some of our stuff. We have a, a partnership with them. So uh, that's what we do there. And then the podcast, we put out a podcast once a week where we discuss the latest, coolest science. And it's about a 15 minute podcast. So here are some screenshots. Um, like I said, the primary point of real clear science is aggregation. That's our primary job. But then putting out original content is the secondary job. And so this is, this is what, if you come to our website, it would look like something like this where we've got the lead story is Do Living Crystals Reveal the Origin of Life by a very prominent science writer named Brandon Kine from Wired magazine. And then we have Gold Digging Bacteria Make Precious Particles from Ewan Calloway of Nature. Ewan Calloway got his master's degree in microbiology from the University of Washington. 
then we, we reprinted a piece from Science Nordic, and we've got a piece from Big Think, the new scientist, the MIT Tech Review, Guardian, the Economist, TechCrunch. So these are not written for professionals in the field, but it's written for intelligent people who want to learn about science. And if we're all honest with ourselves, I'm assuming most of you are biological science people. If I gave you guys an abstract from an astronomy paper, I, no one would have any clue what's going on. And so you, you have to, that's why we link to popular science, because even for us, my area of expertise is microbiology. Outside of that, I have no idea what I'm reading when I'm reading an abstract from archive, which is on you know quantum oscillation. Like I don't even know what that means. So that's why we link to those. If you notice in the lower right corner, we have our Newton blog. That's where we publish a uh, daily thesis. And uh, here's our video aggregator. So this is my assistant's job. So he, he finds science videos. Uh, there's a particularly quirky guy who has, you know, he's like the, you know, like, when you think of like the crazy scientist who has like the white hair that's sticking up, this is what he looks like. And he just mixes chemicals all day and like you watch things explode. He's awesome. And he's British too, so he's got a great accent. <laughs> And it somehow makes it seem much more intellectual when a British guy is blowing stuff up. <laughs> and so we, uh, we follow him, and so we have a great video resource, we think, for people to, to watch science videos. Uh, this actually was a really great piece by my assistant, Ross Pomeroy, a scientific genius extinct. He read a piece in Nature making this case by a guy named Dean Kith Simonton, who was making the case that essentially that the Albert Einstein's of the world are gone. We don't have people like that anymore. And that genius now takes place in these big conglomerates. You know, when you have a microarray paper and there's 800 authors on it, he said those are the kinds of things we're seeing with science now. You know, take that for what it is. It's an interesting opinion. Um, but we, we wrote about that. That ended up being a really popular piece. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I wrote this one, guys, what's worse than erectile dysfunction? Uh, death was my only conclusion. Um, and so this, the journal club, is actually something that you're familiar with, obviously. The goal of this is to take a figure from an open access paper, because we don't have rights to reprint just any figure. We can get sued by nature or by anyone if we, if we publish one of their figures. So I go to open access papers, and we publish stuff for people to come and read, and I discuss the figure just like you would in a typical journal club. Oops. And then if you're interested in our podcast, uh, we're up on iTunes there. Just go to Real Queer Science in iTunes and you can uh, listen to our podcast. So that's my day job. That's what pays the bills. That's what puts food on the table. Uh, but I also like to write in my spare time and do other things. So this is all the places I've been published. This is uh, a, a selection of places I've published in a few other places. Uh, some that I'm proud of and some less proud of. Uh, but these are the really high profile places that I've published. I've been in the USA Today and The Economist, and what you can see up there. So uh, the way you get here is by making contacts. And I actually had a colleague at Real Clear who knew the editor at USA Today. And that's, that's, sadly, that's how you get around in this field. You have to know people. And, I mean, of course, you have to be able to deliver as well. You can't just be a schmuck who can't write. Uh, but you, you do need to know people. And so the most important thing, uh, besides being a good writer, is making lots of contacts. If you like to sit in your house all day and not talk to anybody, then you're going to have a hard time making, you know, making yourself successful in this career. So that's just something to keep in mind. And then I wrote a book. Um, <laughs> How do you do that if you, if you ever feel the inclination to write a book? Uh, you are supposed to write a book proposal, which I did not do. And instead, I wrote some sample chapters, and I pitched it to a few different book agents. And the first couple of book agents, uh, I think, hated it. And they got, we got a response kind of like, well, the book's OK. OK, I'll take it. Okay, that's, that's not the guy you want. You want the guy who says, wow, this book's awesome. We're going to you know, get the best deal we can for this. And that's what we did. I, we got a book agent. We got a $40,000 advance in the book. Yeah. How did you find your book agent? I, I knew someone who knew a book agent. <laughs> that's, honestly, that's, you know people who know people. That's how you get around. And so now I know, I know at least two people at CNN. I know three people at USA Today. I know two people at Nature. I know at least one person at Science. I know three people at New Scientist. It's just starting to make contacts and getting to know people. And that takes time to do that. And 
it takes patience. Um, so anyway, basically you want to pitch the book to someone who doesn't hate it, preferably someone who loves it. Uh, the premise of my book actually is controversial, um, but to make a long story short, it takes a scientific view of politically charged topics, but it uh, approaches it from the left-wing point of view because there were already two or three books on the market about how conservatives aren't very good at science. There's Republican War on Science, Republican Brain, which is just an abomination to neuroscience. And then there was some other piece, uh, I forgot what it was called, Fool Me Twice, I think, by, by, uh, by uh, some author. They're all right-wing attack books, saying, you know, hey, Republicans are stupid, conservatives are stupid. I said, okay, well, then, yeah, I mean, of course, but, <laughs> but you know, but let's, let's not give a free pass to the left. I mean, the anti-vaccine movement started there, the anti-nuclear movement started there, the anti-GMO movement, you know, you guys are probably all genetically modified things. Well, the left wing hates that. And so I said, come on, you know, we got to talk about this. So I wrote a book about that. Half people hate it, half people love it. So, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's just kind of what you do. If you want to talk more about that, I've got, I actually got a copy of it with me. And I'm willing to give it away. <laughs> but I haven't figured out how to do it yet. So <laughs> it'd probably be some name some microbe or something. Okay, that's enough about me. You. What if you want to transition into a career in science journalism, what do you need to do to do that? Well, getting a good start involves asking yourself two questions. Do I like writing and am I good at writing? because it doesn't matter how much you like it. If you're not good at it, you're not gonna get paid for it. And the problem is that a lot of people think that they're good at writing and they're actually not. I've had people send me stuff. <laughs> when you get a job as an editor, you get people who pitch ideas to you. And I got someone who recently sent me uh, this long, detailed, uh, scientific piece. Like, he documented all this evidence, and I'm reading through it, and I'm like, well, this guy's pretty thorough. And his general point was that the Earth was 6,000 years old. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> okay, trash. And, and so, you know, so you get a lot of people who are kooky, and you, and you have to kind of separate the wheat from the chaff. So be a good writer and, and know what you're talking about. I, I know you guys already know what you're talking about, but you have to be a clear, good communicator. And you might actually need to ask somebody, read this. It doesn't make sense. The, you know, do you like this? Is it interesting? Someone needs to be honest with you. I also recommend to practice. And the way you practice is by taking a science journalism class. I think they have them again here. But if not, you can also take just a plain journalism class. Audit the journalism class. Journalism 101. Sit in with the undergraduates. And they'll make you write five or six articles probably throughout the quarter. At least you're getting clips. You're getting things that you can then submit to other people and say, hey, look, I've written stuff. Look at the Washington Sea Grant Science Writing Fellowship. Not only will that get you a feature story published in Sea in the, in the Sea Grant magazine, you'll also get like a thousand dollars. So it's uh, something worth looking into. Now I trust you my my real life success story. Uh, a friend of mine who who started here at the University of Washington, unbeknownst to me, we actually went to the same undergraduate school, the same small university in Southern Illinois. And we were four years apart, so we never knew each other. But she came here, and we met in this science writing class. And she told me, oh, well, you know, we went to the same school. And oh, great. So anyway, we meet you know, serendipitously in this science writing class. And then she decides to drop out of the program. She's not happy being a researcher. But I was already like five years into the program, so I stuck with it. She was only like two years into the program and decided that was enough for her. So she then takes two journalism classes, the science writing class and this just general journalism class. Because of that, she landed an internship at Fermilab. Now Fermilab is a very famous physics lab in the Chicagoland suburbs. She doesn't know anything about physics. She was a molecular biologist. Didn't matter because they thought, she's smart, she's got a master's degree, we can train her to write about physics. And that's what happened. So she becomes a, uh, a uh, writer at Fermilab. Once you get the first internship, you can then get a second internship. And she got hired by science. And from there, her career took off. Because then science hired her, and then she moved to New Scientist. She lived in London, she lived everywhere. She's now in San Francisco. She's a San Francisco-based reporter for New Scientist. That is the more traditional path 
to get to this point. But there are some points of advice that need to be, need to be brought up. Um, you need to, to get clips, you need to take journalism classes, and there are other strategies as well. You may want to start writing for local papers, start submitting things to the Seattle Times, start submitting things to blogs that you like to read. Uh, preferably not your own blog, because you know anyone can start a blog and write, and it's not really that impressive to say, hey, I've got 100 articles on my own blog. Uh, it's more impressive to say, well, someone else has read it, and they gave it a thumbs up, and they published it. So write for someone else. Unfortunately, you may have to do it for free. Uh, when I wrote for CNN, I got nothing. You just got the honor of saying you wrote for CNN. Um, so that, don't be surprised if you don't get paid for it. That's part of the process. But you're getting paid right now to be in graduate school, sort of. And so uh, you, know, you can do this in your spare time. Write an article once a month. You know, just start building your portfolio. Internships uh, are key. In fact, that was what uh, my friend told me. She said internships are definitely the way to go. Another alternative would be to do more school. Now, unlike what you're doing now, which is being paid to go to school, or at least I was, I don't know if you guys are, but I got a stipend here of $26,000 my last year. If you decide to do a science writing program, they won't pay you, you'll pay them. Okay, So it's, it's like going to law school or medical school. But the upside is that it's not as expensive, and it only lasts like a year. So if you go to the UC Santa Cruz program, which has the reputation of being the best in the, in the country, if you go into UC Santa Cruz, you will get a job when you leave. Like, these people get hired. This is, this is like the Harvard, this is like getting the Harvard MBA. This is the equivalent of that in the science writing world. You go to UC Santa Cruz for a year, you graduate there, you're going to get a job. Uh, MIT and NYU and Johns Hopkins also have uh, very reputable science writing programs. Uh, unfortunately, UW doesn't have one. Okay, you all heard of the six degrees, like we're all separated by six degrees from everybody. Um, okay, so that's also true of Kevin Bacon. We're uh, all six degrees from Kevin Bacon. The point here is, that didn't work, did it? I thought it was, was going to get a big laugh. Okay, so the key here is that networking is 50% of your job, okay? Um, when I, here let me give you a strategy, whenever I just link to an article on real career science, if it's somebody that I've never talked to before, I will just send them an email and say, hey, uh, my name's Alex, I'm the editor of real career science, and we're linking to your article, good job. You do that, like that's half your job, it's just reaching out to people, letting them know you're there, okay? So, do that. Do informational interviews. That's a sneaky way of saying, uh, I'd like to have an interview at Nature. I'm not looking for a job, but I'd like to know what kind of things you do here, okay? They're much more willing to do informational interviews, and then they'll remember you next time you actually do apply for the job. It shows that you have some initiative, okay? Uh, there is an organization called the National Association of Science Writers, which I joined for a year and I, I didn't renew my membership. It, it might be useful for students who are coming in looking for a job because they will post uh, job postings and internship postings. So that might be worth your time to join that until you get a job. Uh, another way to meet people, uh, and I actually, this worked really well for me, uh, I went to the AAAS conference, and the AAAS is the American Association of Advancement of Science. They run, they run the magazine Science, I believe. Uh, they had uh, a conference up in Vancouver. When I was in Vancouver, I met the lady who runs the CNN Light Years blog, and we're now starting to work together, and I met a guy from The Economist. And it was always one of those things that I wanted to publish one article in The Economist before I dropped dead, and I published two already. And I still have a long way to go before I drop dead, I think. Yeah. I just want to mention, um, there's a local affiliate of NASW called Northwest Science Writers that's on Facebook and um, at nwscience.org that puts on events, some of them on campus. Yes, that is, that is correct as well. And I, I would imagine you get a discount if you join the, the National Association, you might get a discount for joining the Northwest? No, but Northwest is really cheap. Okay. So doing that, uh, joining the NASW and the, the Seattle affiliate, uh, you know, go. How many of you are actually microbiologists? Oh wow, okay. How about? Uh, okay, I don't know. I don't know the other organizations. Uh, I know American Society of Microbiology. 
uh, and the American Chemical Society are two of the two of the biggest organizational meetings in the country, in the world, actually, for scientists. Go to one and hang out in the newsroom because that's where all the journalists are. Okay, and you meet people and hey, you know, this person works for Nature. This person works. For, you know, I met a guy in Nature who worked for Nature and the Economist and CNN when I went to AAAS. And uh, that's a great way to make contacts. It, it really is about who you know and making a, building a good reputation, a repertoire with, with people that you know. Also, email writers and editors. Some of them are so busy that they'll never respond to you, ever. Kind of like your uh, dissertation committee professors. Um, but some of them do. And the ones that do are usually nice people, and they're really easy to get along with because they, have they made time for you. They don't know who you are. Those are the kind of people you need to know. So just randomly email people say, hey, you know, I'm looking for a job, or I want to know more about what you do. Just do it. Some of them respond. The fourth piece of advice is be persistent. The journalism job market is tough. Uh, the Seattle Times cut their science section a few years ago. They used to have one. They don't have one anymore. Um, journalism in general is a tough place to get, a, to get your career going. Uh, but if you're a good writer, you'll get a job. And like I said, that comes with a caveat. A lot of people think they're good writers, and they aren't necessarily good writers. Two things you need to be okay with. Cheap labor, but you're already used to that. And criticism, which you're probably already used to that too. Uh, but not only criticism from editors, criticism from your audience, which is different. Um, because people who don't know anything about science will call you names, you're a shill for, if you write, I've written articles about how raw milk is bad for you, and most people in here are like, yeah, because you get E. coli. My response, the response I got on CNN was someone said that if I came down to the South, they would shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> because I said there's E. coli raw milk. <laughs> so, uh, be used to stinging criticism from, from people who don't know what they're talking about. That's part of the job, too. Yeah? I guess Well, person, person who says they're going to shoot you is not looking for a discussion. <laughs> uh, it, it, it depends. If it's, if it's a reasonable comment, uh, sometimes I'll engage with those people. If it's something that's, that's kooky, sometimes I'll engage with them, but usually people online aren't interested in learning anything. I mean, it, it's, it's just the way it is. The people who comment are looking for argument, they're looking to inflame people, and they're looking to irritate you. It, you just need to kind of, but what I like to say is that if you read the comment section, it really challenges your faith in humanity, I think. <laughs> and, and so you have to just learn to just kind of build a wall and go, whatever, you know, that's the, probably the best strategy. So that's the online comments. You, you mentioned that your book was received, you know, like 50, 50, half loved it, half yeah. loved it. And I, I think it's good to have both, I, I would imagine, because you want to kind of spark some. It depends on what your goal is. If you're selling a book, the more controversy you generate, it can actually help book sales. Um, but you know, I, I, I'm not a guy who likes actual controversy. Like, I will write something that's provocative, but I'm not the kind of guy who then goes out and argues with people on Facebook. I don't like to do that. And what makes me really uncomfortable when people get angry, and that's something that I'm trying to work on. I'm trying to keep building this wall. You know, and yeah. So all of you will bring strengths and weaknesses to the job. And that's one of my weaknesses. I take it too. Um, you know, when they, when they tell you, when you got to graduate school, they told you, you should really want to be here. You should really want to be a scientist. And that's true, because it's, it's hard work, and they don't pay you much. And that's pretty much true of science journalism. Uh, you're not going to make a lot when you start out. And, and you may never end up making more than 50, 60, 70, 000, 000. I mean, you'll, you'll live comfortably, but that, that comes years down the line. That's not going to happen right away. So, be sure this is something you want to do. That it's not just something that, well, if I can't find a postdoc, then I'll do this. Like, you really need to think hard about this because it takes a lot of work. And you need to really like writing. If you don't like writing, then you know, definitely don't do it. Um, another strategy would be to get a job and write on the side until you get hired. Um, maybe not a postdoc, because I couldn't imagine your professor liking the idea that you're just there for a year you know, until you shuffle off somewhere else. But maybe you took a job in biotech or did something else and you you know, at night time working on this job. So you took off your career. So, my invitation to you. And see, look, we're done like 25 minutes early, too. 
Um, start building your portfolio now. Uh, I will invite all of you and all of your friends and anyone who wasn't here, anyone who knew <coughs> Brian was smart, submit articles to Real Clear Science. We will publish them. We can't pay you, but we will start getting clips for you. And it actually makes a difference. If you want to go into this, you know, you will have a publication on Real Clear Science, the national website. Um, there are three types of articles that we generally look for. One is just pure news. The way you find pure news articles is you monitor a website called Eureka Word. That is the one that sends out hundreds of press releases every day. You can organize them by subject, or you can organize them by date, or, or whatever. Monitor that, and whatever is a cool story, write up a piece and send it to us. We also take science opinion. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little opinionated. And so I, uh, I particularly like to enjoy, I particularly like to write science opinion pieces. Uh, and then we also like explainer articles, like which is just a here's you know here's the science of bacterial LPS, and just gives a piece on that. But you know you have to write it for a general audience, not for for graduate students. And so uh, we pretty much take anything if it's about science, it's well written, we'll take it. And our definition of science sometimes stretches to include things like psychology and education. <laughs> so we stretch it a little bit sometimes because we just want to have a good place for smart, good academic writing. And uh, so that's my invitation to you. Please, please send us. And Alex at realclearscience.com. That should be pretty easy. That's it. So whatever questions you've got. There was one person over here in his life. What is your uh, typical work day like? <laughs> uh, my wife hates it. Uh, basically, I, I'm a night person. I like to do all of my work at nighttime. That's my natural proclivity to do that. So I will generally work from about 4 or 5 p.m. in the, e in the evening till about 7 or 8, she comes home, I watch her TV, eat dinner, get back to work around 10 or 11, and then work till 3 in the morning. Uh, and then I sleep till noon, and then I get up, work an hour or two in the afternoon, and then the cycle repeats like that. So that's what I do. And then in my, in the, in the, I have a, usually a generally big block of time in the middle of the day where I'm not doing anything. So I'll eat lunch, and then I will work on an article for a freelance piece or something like that. Or I've actually just been brought on to author a biotechnology textbook, and I'll probably be spending some time doing that over the next year or so. So basically, you don't have like really uh, a life. Uh, <laughs> or no, uh, no set schedule. That's one of the benefits of having an online job, and particularly with my boss, who's in Baltimore. One boss is in Baltimore, and one boss is in Chicago. And as long as the work gets done, they could care less what you want. <laughs> so that is one of the benefits of having an online job. But you have to be self-motivated. I mean, you have to keep working. You got to tell yourself, "Gotta get up to work," and that doesn't work for everybody. I'm paid a salary by Real Clear Science. The, the Real Clear Politics owns all of the Real Clear sites, and I draw a salary from them. Advertising. And sponsorships. Can you talk a little bit more about? Because I was wondering exactly that. Is it an accident that your site was just like Real Clear Politics? But it sounds like no, that it's part of it. So how did that subsidiary happen? Did you did you approach Real Clear Politics and say, hey, I want to make this site? Yeah. At the time, they had four sites. They had politics, world markets, and sports. That was it. And I said, this is a great resource. We should do this in science. And they hired me. Really, it was that simple. Um, of course, it took about a year for them to hire me, or two years, because uh, he doesn't respond to emails for about six months. And even after I got hired, he still doesn't respond for emails for six months. So um, that's just kind of how it is. But yeah, it, it, I, I really was quite blessed. Very fortunate to be in the place that I was in at that time, um, because most people don't get careers by just emailing someone saying, hey, you know, hire me, and it, it just worked out that way. If you want to know what else I was looking into, I actually had applied to the CIA. <laughs> and I, I made it through the first round here at the University of Washington. And they uh, then invited me to fill out this online form. And I think after you do that, they invite you out to, to, to Virginia for the follow-up round. And 
and then I got hired by Real Clear in that meantime. So I, I disbanded the CIA. But I've always wondered how different my life could be. <laughs> like if I was giving a talk here, I'm like, and unfortunately now I have to kill everybody because you can't walk out of here with that. I think one that doesn't bring, one who's, who's a clear writer, that's, that's gotta be one thing. One, something else that you have to have a knack for picking out what you think people want to read, okay? Because as much as I like my dissertation project, a lot of people aren't interested in the isolation states of lipid A in bacterial polysaccharides. It's just not a big topic, okay? So you have to have a, a, a knack for knowing well, what appeals to the general audience. You know, dinosaurs with feathers, that always, that always works. Right, I mean, look how many childhoods we burst with that. And, well, you guys don't, do you guys know this? They think dinosaurs have feathers now. Um, and, and then I think that one thing that has kind of ruined science journalism in a way, and that was the reason why we wrote our book partially, uh, science journalism carries a political overtone to it, where people will say, well, we're going to advance this particular agenda. And I'm not saying that they're promoting global warming. What I'm saying is that they just assume that you are on board with cap and trade and carbon tax and all the policies that you may not actually be on board with. And so that makes me uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable when a science journalist steps away from the science and starts to advocate policy. I think that's dangerous for, for science journalism and for journalism as a whole, okay? And we actually wrote a chapter in our book called The Death of Science Journalism. And the, the, it was actually my co-author who wrote that. And the premise of it was when scientists become cheerleaders for science, when they start endorsing scientific policies, you're actually undermining journalism. You're undermining science journalism. Because people look at that and they're saying, you're just talking on behalf of this political party or that political party. You're not actually just giving us the straight science. And I think that that is really important for a journalist. That I've actually wanted to get back into teaching. I was a TA here. And, and if I ever did that, that would be like my, you know, you've got to be objective when you do science journalism. Yeah. The way I say it, we don't play for Team Red. We don't play for Team Blue. We play for Team Science. And I think that should be the role of a science journalist. Do you have a sense for who your audience is on the site? And do you, have, do you guys actively try to expand your audience or oh, yeah. sort of yeah. general science education? So, uh, you know, our demographics are probably, actually, I don't know. You know, I don't know who the demographics are for our site, to be honest. Uh, Real Clear Politics knows who the demographics are of their site. Um, but I don't know what this what it is for our site, so I, I actually couldn't say. Um, but yeah, outreach is part of what I do. I don't have a publicist, so I am the publicist. I'm the editor, the writer, and the publicist. <laughs> and so yeah, outreach is one of our big things. Yeah. So you were saying that you wrote because they didn't have a science section, but now you were also talking about that you have three other people. With you. Yeah, How so did it come about that? Real Clear expanded. So we, we, when we launched Real Clear Science, we actually also launched Real Clear Religion. So they have, uh, they're aggregating, it's the same functions that we're doing. We're aggregating religion news and having original religion stories. We launched at the same time. And then we brought on, I think, four more sites. We have now Real Clear History, which has become really popular, uh, Real Clear Technology, Real Clear Policy, and Real Clear Energy. Mm -hmm. And so we've expanded. Uh, since since I was hired. But how did you bring the other science, like how did the other science writers come in Oh, I, I recommended, uh, so he actually contacted me and he said he was a big fan of Real Clear and it'd be a real honor for him to uh, publish something on our site. So I spoke to him. You see scratching my back, I'm like, yeah, we are pretty awesome, aren't we? <laughs> and uh, we published him and I ended up having a really good relationship with this guy. And then he started, we brought him on as a blogger. We paid him per blog piece. We paid them like 75 bucks per blog entry. And then I got tired of working on the weekend, so I gave him the weekend update. And then after he proved that he could not only write, but he could actually run the, the, the website when I'm not there on the weekend, we hired him. And so that's how we brought him on. The physics guy is just a, uh, a pay per 
pay-per-view. <laughs> you know, we, we pay him per blog post. He's not an official employee. Yeah. Nice. People in Zimbabwe like only will say, okay, I am scientist, I did COVID. No, but you got to stop right there. That's an awesome accent. Where are you from? <laughs> My wife is Polish. <laughs> Don't fight. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay, I did good research. I wanted to publish something about me and about my research. Yeah. Then how you will you will give a share it about price or, or how does it work? Or you will be really objective to say okay, is it really important story or not? So we we tend the only person we're paying besides me and my assistant who are employees of Real Clear, we pay one water. And he's a physics guy, but that's like it. We are we are we don't really want to pay because we don't have the budget to do it. No, that's no, I mean, on the contrary, that somebody suggests you money in order that you write about somebody's research. For example, I, oh. I, I like, for example, oh no 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 no, no. I think it's good. No, no. Other people don't think it's good. They're like, oh, you know. <laughs> 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 I think I think that would be uh, I could probably get fired for that. I think. <laughs> yeah, we, we wouldn't do that. If you, but if you wanted to me to write about your research, okay. just send me the, the paper and say, hey, you know, please consider writing about this. But I couldn't take money to do that. Uh, that, that would be that would be bad. <laughs> that would be bad. So you have this point: not take money from. Yeah. You don't have clients. Yeah. No. 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 The only people we take money from are advertisers. So, you know, if, if uh, a biotech company around here wanted to sponsor our site, we would, we would, then we would say, hey, this site is sponsored by Zymogen, you know. Buy those purple pills or whatever they sell, I don't know. But, you know, that, that's the only way we make money is through sponsorships and advertising. Yeah. So is it allowed to learn about medicine differently? I, I think medicine kind of falls in the general science writers category. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the medical writers and the science writers kind of all know each other. So I would think if all this would apply to, to medicine as well. Yeah, just to follow up comment about uh, your class taught by Dr. Deborah Illman. Um, it's been moved from the Oceanography Department to the Department of Environmental Health in the School of Public Health, and it's open to all graduate students. So it looks like it'll be taught again next year, winter quarter, as Environmental Health 590. Oh, that's fantastic. She uh, I think you probably could at least audit it. Yeah, I'm taking it. It's fantastic. Deborah Elman is easily one of the best professors I've ever had in my ten years in school. And I highly recommend it. If you've got the chance. Along that there's another um, science communication class taught by Isha McFarlane, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning writer. She's written a lot of a lot. That's also a good class in the communication department. I mean, did you have a question? From like 10 minutes ago. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to ask, how many hours do you devote to your salary job versus getting to write versus It varies. Um, I would say 30 to 40. It depends on the week. I mean, the, the thing is, is that when I work, I tend to just sit down and work. <coughs> You know, so like, you know, normal jobs and you're like, I work 40 hours a week, like, do you really? Like, you know, I, I know you drink coffee, like, you know, but I, when I sit down, I work and I, and I so I, I put in a solid, yeah, I would say the average week is probably 30 to 40 hours a week. And it's, and you're reading, that's, that's what makes it tiring, is that you're reading and writing, and by the end of the day, like, your brain's cooked, yeah? And then whatever spare time I have, I, I write. That's the worst. It's at the end of Thursday is the day that I write. This is actually my writing. You guys are robbing my writing time right now. <laughs> and uh, I write two articles on Thursday, and my brain wants to explode by the end of the day. So, so we need to start drinking after this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering what you see as um, your trajectory from here, from your position now. Like, what what kind of advancement will you have? Like, how will your job change over the next? That's, that's a good question. I really like where I work, and so I don't foresee changing anything. Um, and I'm not just saying that because, like, oh, my boss will fire me. Like, no, I, I really like it. I, the, the, the flexibility is amazing. 
Um, we all kind of cover for each other, so if I want to go on vacation with my wife for a day or two, I'll just swap with my assistant and say, hey, cover me on Monday, I'll cover you on Friday. Done. And like the flexibility is just amazing. And because it's an internet job, I can work from Timbuktu. Well, they're under attack right now. So maybe like, you know, Madrid. Or, uh, you know, I, I work from Poland, actually, when we go back and visit uh, her family. So I love that flexibility. That is hard to give up. Because most jobs, you have to go to the office. And it's an East Coast job, too. Like, I don't want to live in Washington, D.C. Alcohol's nice. <laughs> Thanks, guys.